You're listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's message is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. Well, if you would take your Bibles at this time and turn to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 6. The institution of marriage is such a precious gift. It's a gift from God to those whom he has granted to be married. And it's a wonder of his grace. And therefore, it is a sad thing when we see that the husbands and wives, either one or both, are unable to repent or unable to forgive, and so unable, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bear with one another in love. And so, in not being able to do this, they, they do not experience the sweetness of marriage. They, they do not know the joy of marriage. And we can know the joy of marriage even despite our sin. As we learn to love and forgive each other, to repent and confess and forgive. Marriage is so vital. It is the foundation of our society. Marriage as God has defined it, within the boundaries that God has set. For he is the one who has created and ordained marriage. So therefore, he is the one who has the say over marriage. And he has made it very clear as well that the marriage bed is not to be defiled. That that relationship, the physical relationship that is to be within those boundaries of marriage is such a great part of that gift and glorious. Only sinful creatures like us could take such a good and precious gift and foul it up so badly that we make a wreckage of this gift and degrade such holy things. And we degrade them to such an extent that our society around us has such a twisted and perverse and upside-down understanding and view of marriage and sexuality. So much so that we've lost in our society all common sense and any kind of right thinking on these things. And yet the scriptures show us the importance of marriage and how good and glorious it really is. And it shows us how important marriage is as marriage is used to point us to the gospel, as an illustration of the gospel, when it's upheld according to God's standard. Marriage is a picture of God's love for his people, at least it's supposed to be. We read in the prophet Jeremiah, God say that although Israel broke covenant with them, even though he was a husband to them. And we see in Scripture, in the New Testament, the roles of wives and husbands within the home and how they are to demonstrate Christ's love for the church. We read the words of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 24. There Paul says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And then we see what Paul says in verses 25 to 27. He says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And if we had the time to go through this passage, we'd see Paul say, I'm talking about the church. And so marriage is a reflection of, again, God's love, Christ's love for his church and the relationship that there is between the two. So much so, Todd Friel said this, He said, marriage is God's cosmic play that he puts on, and you are assigned a role in the play. Sir, you play the role of Jesus. 
Madam, you play the role of the church so that the world would see our relationship and go, oh, is that what it looks like to be in a right relationship with Jesus Christ? I see. Look at how he loves her. That's how Jesus loves his church. And so husbands, are you loving your wife, striving to love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her? Marriage illustrates for us such crucial aspects of the gospel. And I say all this because as we come to our text here this afternoon, we see once again marriage is used to illustrate a crucial aspect of the gospel. Although not quite the way we see in the examples I gave and and the passages we normally think of. We see here, as the Apostle Paul continues to dive deeper and deeper into the gospel, in which the righteousness that is from God is revealed from faith to faith, as he develops the doctrine of justification through faith alone, he demonstrates his point with marriage. But instead of using the binding commitment and deep love and affection that is to accompany marriage and self-sacrifice that comes in marriage, Instead, he points to the limits of marriage. That marriage is only binding for this life. Because in marriage, when there is a death, the marriage bonds are dissolved. And the living spouse is then free to marry another. So too, in our salvation, there also has been a death. We died with Christ. And since there is a death, we are no longer bound, as Paul says, to the law. But we are now free then to belong to another, to belong to Christ. And so again, Paul is using marriage to illustrate this. In marriage, death releases one from belonging to one spouse, and then they are free then to belong to another. And so we come to this passage as we've been working through Romans verse by verse— And we've seen Paul has made it very clear that when we trusted in Christ for salvation, and so have Christ as our representative, with his life, death, and resurrection credited to us by faith, when we are saved then and found in Christ, we cannot remain the same, because we're not the same. For when God saved us by the work of Jesus Christ, with his work credited to us, his death for our sin, became our death to sin. So the person we used to be in Adam, the person enslaved to sin, is now dead. And then Christ then being raised, we have been raised with him so that we may now walk in the newness of life. Yes, we still wrestle with sin, and not one of us has reached sinlessness. Nonetheless, though, sin is no longer our slave master. We have died to sin and are now alive to God, and therefore we are to offer our members, the parts of ourselves, to not unrighteousness, but righteousness. For now we are slaves of God. And all of this is true since we have been justified through faith. And having been justified, God then is doing a work of sanctification in us. He's doing a work to grow us in holiness. We are therefore to be going to war against whatever sin remains in us. Again, our sanctification, like our salvation, is the work of God in us. But not one of us will be sanctified apart from our obedience. We are to go to war with our sin. We are to seek to kill it and pursue holiness. And Paul has made it clear. We go in salvation from one slave master to another. We go from being a slave to sin, offering our members as weapons of unrighteousness, to being slaves of God, offering ourselves to righteousness. And we saw how Paul was using this slave analogy to explain this spiritual truth that can be hard to understand. 
And so now as we come to our text here this afternoon, we see Paul use another analogy to illustrate a related point. And so here we see him use, as we said, this illustration of marriage. So before, Paul dealt with the believer's relationship with sin, that if you are saved, you are no longer a slave to sin. But now, as we look at our text for this afternoon, he is showing how the believer relates to the law. And really, as we go through chapter 7, we'll see not only how the believer relates to the law, but we'll also see how the law relates to sin, as he's even already touched on that a bit in Romans. And so that's where we are for this afternoon. This is where we pick up the text. And so if you would, read along with me as I read out loud verses 1 through 6 of chapter 7. Paul says, Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So as we look at these verses... We see Paul states his point here in verse 1. And then he makes the illustration to explain the point there in verses 2 through 3. And then in verses 4 through 6, he applies the illustration and drives home his point. Now, as we see here in verse 1, Paul says, Or do you not know? And we've seen him say this back in chapter 6, verse 3. Do you not know? And he said a similar thing, a little different, In chapter 6, verse 16. And each time he says this, his point is, I know that you know what I'm about to say. You do know it. This is so basic and so fundamental, so obvious, you know it. And I'm sure you do. Do you not know? Yes, you do know. And we see he makes this little side note here to explain why he's so sure they know what he's about to say. And it is because he's talking to those, he's writing to those who know the law. In context here, the law is in reference to the Mosaic law. And though there are some who debate and say, well, this is talking about natural law or this is talking about Roman law, I would argue it's very clear. It's actually the law of God that's in view here. As later in the chapter, Paul will give an example from the Ten Commandments. And I would even argue, even the illustration he uses, he's taking from God's law on marriage. Now, some then argue, if this is God's law, the law given through Moses, uh, then that must mean that Paul is writing to a Jewish audience, that this is a Jewish church, since they know the law. Uh, But we discussed back in the introduction to this series that that's Really not the case. This is a a mixed church of both Jews and Gentiles, and it likely was prominently or mostly made up of Gentiles. But that doesn't mean they would not have known the law. I mean, just think, what was the Bible of the early church before the New Testament was finished? It was the Old Testament. And I'm sure, as we can testify in many ways, as we've already seen in Romans, the law would have been part of the gospel proclamation. They all would have been familiar with the law. They all would have known it, even as Gentiles. And so what Paul was putting forward here, what he's about to say is something that if you know the law is going to be obvious to you. It's going to be common sense. And what is that? Well, it's the fact that the law only has authority over someone while they are alive. 
It does not reach beyond death to keep someone bound to its written demands. In death, we suffer the consequences of not upholding the law in life. But the law is not called for to be upheld after death. It only holds us accountable to what we do in this life. We see that the giving of the law demanded that one strive to keep the law, that they would live by it. We read in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5, God says, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. And there was also great warnings in the law for those who did not keep it. There's great warnings of cursings that would come for not keeping the law. Israel was warned of all of these things that would happen to them if they broke covenant with God because they disobeyed his commands. And as we see those curses laid out in Deuteronomy chapter 27, we read this in verse 26. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And all the people shall say, Amen. And it's this verse here that the Apostle Paul refers to in Galatians chapter 3, when he talks about all who do not keep the law, that if you're striving for your salvation to earn your way by keeping the law, if you don't keep the law, you're cursed. If you are going to bind yourself to the law, you're cursed. Because who has kept the law? But what did we read back in chapter 6, verse 14 of Romans? Paul told his readers that they were not under law, but under grace. And we discussed then how the law is that external standard. It is outside of us, but gives no power within us to obey it, to keep it. It gives no ability for one who is so sinful as me to ever have a chance of keeping God's standard of righteousness and what is good. No, I have not kept his law. It's very clear as I look to the Ten Commandments. I am a false worshiper. I have been an idolater. I've been a blasphemer, a murderer, an adulterer at heart, a thief and a liar. What hope is there for me? Well, the hope that there is for me is the fact that now I am not under law, but I am under grace. But how? How have I been released from the demands of the law to be taken into custody of grace? Well, that's Paul's point here as we come into chapter 7. That's what he's getting at. The way to be released from the law is that there had to be a death. And there was a death. According to Paul, I died. And when did I die? When I trusted in Jesus Christ. When his death was credited to me. So in a real way, I died when Christ died. And everyone who is trusting in Christ, everyone who is in him by faith, he is their representative before God the Father. And so all who are trusting in Christ were in Christ when he died, so that his death was their death. And so we were crucified with Christ, having died with him in this way. And therefore, since we died in this way, we have come out from under the law. For Paul says here, the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. So once you die, you are no longer bound to the law. And so again, to make sure his point is clear, Paul illustrates this through the example of marriage. And so we read there in verse 2, he says, For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Marriage is something that's not eternal. It's only for this life. Now even as we say that, though, I think to really understand Paul's illustration here, we have to understand the idea that it is for this life. That it is a commitment that is lifelong. That no matter our circumstances, no matter what we're going through, no matter what the other has done or anything that we can say, we have committed to being with this one person for life. 
That's why we say for better or for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health. Whatever the circumstances are. In marriage, we have given our word. And how good is your word? We lay down our lives with this vow. You are giving yourself completely to the loyalty towards this person in body, mind, and heart. Your emotions and your will all given in your commitment to the one you have married. And we see the extent of this commitment. That it is of all of us. It's our whole selves. Again, it's not just physically giving myself to this one person or, or the time I spend with this one person or, or whatever it is. It's emotions. It's our thoughts. It's our everything. It's what we even set before our eyes. Because what did Jesus say in Matthew chapter, or, yeah, Matthew chapter 5? That if you even look with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. That's the extent of our commitment to this one person that I won't even look at another. Now, too, looking at what Jesus says there, it's obvious he's pointing to the, the intentions and condition of our hearts before God. And so one is guilty of lust, whether or not guilty of adultery and lust, whether they're married or not. But nonetheless, we see the full loyalty that is called for in marriage. Even if there is a divorce. Divorce does not free one then to marry another. Because you have committed yourself to this one. Now, just to be clear, there are some who would say that under no circumstances can one divorce and remarry. I would argue that there are clearly two exception clauses in the New Testament. Uh, for example, we read in Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, Jesus says, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So again, just because one is divorced does not mean that God sees that marriage is dissolved. And so if you go and marry another, Scripture makes it clear that's adultery. And Jesus says, though, except for sexual immorality, except for if one gives themselves physically to another. And we also have to think, though, we don't have time to get into this passage, uh, but Jesus is, is being challenged on when can someone get a divorce, and, and the teaching of the day was that a man could divorce his wife for any reason. The example that's usually given going through this passage is, is that if she burns supper or burns the toast, then you can divorce her. Uh, that was the thought of the day. And Jesus is saying, no, that's, that's not how marriage was intended to be. That was not God's intent. And so Jesus is really pushing what the intentions of the law is, that marriage was to be for life. And he's acknowledging and he's explaining the fact that why Moses gave them the certificate of divorce, and he says it's because their hearts were hard. But our hearts are not supposed to be hard. We're to have soft, pliable hearts, hearts that are, as we see, a reflection of the gospel, ready to forgive when there's repentance. Desiring that reconciliation, seeking that reconciliation. And so even if your circumstance fits this exception clause, that doesn't mean you can automatically run to divorce. God's intentions would be that there is reconciliation and fighting for the marriage. But if the adulterer, the adulterer in the marriage will not reconcile, he will not, and goes, the innocent party is not held accountable to that. And I think, too, we can make this argument as we compare also uh, this, these parallel passages in the Synoptic Gospels in Luke and Mark. Also, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 14 to 16, the Apostle Paul explained that if two people got married as unbelievers, and then one trusts in Christ and so is now saved, but now married to an unbeliever, that doesn't mean the believer should divorce the unbeliever. One's status does not change just because they became a Christian. And so he explains here in verse 14, For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, 
and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. In other words, the marriage, and so to then the children from that marriage, are not illegitimate, but it's all still right in God's sight. Just because a believer got married while they were an unbeliever, and so they are now married to an unbeliever, that does not make the marriage illegitimate now that they are saved. And so suddenly mean that the kids were born in sin. No, this is still a holy union, and everything that has come from it is still holy. And so the believer is not to, be, not to leave their unbelieving spouse. Then Paul says in verse 15, But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? As long as the unbelieving spouse consents to remain with the believing spouse, the believing spouse is to stay married to them. But in the case that the unbelieving spouse leaves or abandons the believing spouse, because of their newfound faith, which is likely because of the change that has occurred in their life, that they're no longer doing the same things that they did before, that they're not able to participate in all the pagan festivals together like they did before and go down uh, and participate in the temple prostitution together like they did before. No, now that Christ has been introduced to this marriage, there's been a change and the unbeliever can't take it, so they go. Paul says, let them go. The believing brother or sister is not enslaved and called to be at peace. But whether in the case of adultery or in the case of abandonment of a believer by an unbelieving spouse, in either case, the one who has not broken the marriage vows is not the one at fault for the marriage vows being broken. But the other one still is before God. The one who did break the marriage vows is accountable before God. The only time the marriage bonds can be dissolved without one or the other spouse or both being accountable to the law's demands for marriage is when there is a death, is when one dies. Then the one who remains is free to marry another. Outside of these two exception clauses concerning the innocent party, if one gets remarried, they are an adulterer in God's sight and according to the law. And so the marriage bonds are really still intact. A divorce does not break those bonds in God's eyes. So where those bonds are still intact, the spouse is not free to remarry as long as their spouse still lives. If one remarries while their spouse is alive, they are an adulterer. But if their spouse dies and they remarry, then they are not an adulterer. Because the law concerning their first marriage has no binding power on them. Because death breaks marriage. And death was the only thing that was meant to break that marriage, to dissolve those vows. And we know death was the only thing meant to do that. Because again, what do we say in our modern vows? Till death do us part. Marriage is to be a lifelong commitment in giving ourselves, laying down our lives for the other. But death brings a parting. And even in that, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul encouraged widows to remarry. Widows in the church. He said, remarry as long as you marry a believer. But Paul's point here is not specifically marriage, right? Paul's point here in Romans is the law. And he's just using marriage to illustrate the point he's making about the law. And the point is that when there is a death, the law, like in the case of marriage, is no longer binding on a person. And so we see this as we go on into verse 4. There in verse 4, Paul says, Likewise, or I think it should be better translated as therefore, here Paul is drawing his conclusion from this illustration and making his point, 
Therefore, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ. And so Paul explains why we're no longer bound to the law, no longer under the law's demands. It's because we died, and so the law has no jurisdiction over us. And again, when did we die? When did you die? The moment you believed. The moment you were saved. The moment you were found to be in Christ, having union with the crucified Christ. Having been crucified with Christ, through the body of Christ, we died. And so just as Paul discusses, this frees us from sin, from the enslavement of sin. That's what we saw earlier in chapter 6. So then, too, this frees us from the law's binding demands over us. For to remain bound to the law would be to remain in judgment. For we of all, all of us, have already not kept the law. We have all broken the law. We all sit here as sinners. And therefore, eternal death and damnation must result if we remain bound to the law. Remember, the law was never intended to save someone through the adherence of the law. For no one can keep the law. Instead, the law shows us our need for Christ. It shows us our need for salvation, that salvation that is only in Jesus Christ. Christ who died freeing us from the law. And so now, having been free from the law, being freed from that relationship under which we are condemned, we then are free to enter into a new relationship. And we do, if we are saved. When we believe, we die to sin, no longer bound by it. We die to the law, so now we can belong to Christ. So we are bound to Christ, having died with him. And as we saw in chapter 6, having died with Christ, we have risen with Christ. His resurrection is our resurrection that we may walk in the newness of life. And we see here, as Paul says, Christ rose, so we rose, in order that we may bear fruit for God. And what is that fruit? Uh, What is it that is produced in our lives? Well, we've seen going through Romans what it is. It is the growth in holiness. It It is our sanctification. It is growing in conformity to God's righteous standard as is reflected in the law. It's being shaped more and more, day by day, into the image of Christ. It's living holy lives, doing good works. Which is, isn't that what we're told is to be the product of salvation in our lives? Good works? What do we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10? Paul said, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. If you will, just let me go off on a little bit of tangent here. Again, as we've already seen going through Romans, if my salvation had anything to do with me, if there was any part I had to play in it, then for as much as I participated in my salvation, I'd be able to boast in my participation. I'd be able to boast in what I've done in order to see me saved however much that may be. But what we see is that it's nothing of ourselves. It is totally and completely the work of God. And so I cannot boast in me for my salvation. I can only boast in my God who saved me through Jesus Christ. Look how great he is. Look how glorious he is. And so then Paul goes on here, and he explains why we're saved by grace through faith, why this is the, not of ourselves, but the gift of God, so that no one can boast. He explains, saying in verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Someone made the point, I think it was Charles Spurgeon, but I don't remember. Uh, But pointing out how this verse clearly shows us, and it does, 
that we are not saved by works, but we are saved for works. And that's exactly right. We are saved for works unto God, works to glorify God in our lives. That is the outcome of our salvation. It's good works. It's the new life. Uh, The old self who used to be enslaved to sin, that old self in Adam has died with Christ. And now since Christ lives, we live in the newness of life. So then dying to the law in all of this, does does that mean then we throw out the law? We have no use for it then because we don't need it, right? Well, no. Uh, That's not what we do either, though. Dying to the law means that we are no longer helplessly bound to meet that external standard that does not empower us to meet it. But instead, we have died to the law to be raised, to live the resurrection life, to live empowered by God, to obey his commands, to obey him in his word, but not by the law, not under the law, but instead we obey and live for God under grace. It is grace that empowers us. It is grace that transforms us from the inside out, that we grow in holiness, that we grow in our obedience to the law, that we would seek to kill our sin. It's grace that we live under now. And so then as we come to verses 5 and 6, Paul explains why he says that we have died to the law, belonging now to Christ who was raised so that we would bear fruit for God. And he explains it by showing what we were before, before we were saved, and comparing that, contrasting that to what we are now that we are saved. And so in verse 5, we see what we were before we were saved, in our natural selves, in the flesh, as he says. So while we were still yet dead in our sins and under the controlling power of sin, before we trusted in Christ, we see our sinful desires, sin's self-seeking intentions were aroused by the law. And so at work, in the parts of us, producing that which leads to death. And notice there in verse 5, it's our sinful desires. It's our lusts, our greeds, our hate and pride and envy. When we are tempted to sin, or when we do sin, it starts with the desires that are already in us. If temptation pops up, and it generally is a temptation to me, It's only a temptation because that desire is already there in me. If I didn't already have the desire, it wouldn't tempt me, right? That only makes sense, yes? And we see this clearly laid out in James chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. He says, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So we see, again, what our sinful desires do in leading us astray as the law is proclaimed. Paul is telling us that our sinful nature is such that when we are told what to do or what not to do, when God's law says, thou shall not or thou shall, it arouses our sinful desires to want to kick back against what we're told to do or not do. That's what rebels we are. Whatever God's word commands us, our response is to say, I'm not going to be told what to do. You are not the boss over me. And no, we may not use those words. But that is what we're saying when we sin. whether it's because we know the law and the law has been presented to us, or whether, as we've seen earlier in Romans, it's the work of the law written on our hearts. Right? That we have a God-given conscience, a knowledge of right and wrong. But we don't want to be bound by anything but other than what we want to do. That's our our natural selves. Uh, This is what makes our sin so heinous. 
that we kick back against our transcendent moral law giver. That we kick back against God's authority over us. On this, R.C. Sproul said, Have you ever considered the deeper implications of the slightest sin, of the most minute peccadillo? What are we saying to our Creator when we disobey Him at the slightest point? We are saying no to the righteousness of God. We are saying, God, your law is not good. My judgment is better than yours. Your authority does not apply to me. I am above and beyond your jurisdiction. I have the right to do what I want to do, not what you command me to do. That is what we are saying with every last sin. That's why Dr. Sproul calls every sin cosmic treason. And he's right. He's exactly right. This is our rebellion against the God who created us, who made us. And we're all born with this rebellion. You know, when Elizabeth was not quite old enough to walk, she was just about old enough to, to pull herself up with furniture. You know that little age with toddlers, and they just they got the chubby cheeks, and they pull themselves up with the furniture, right? It's a standing. And since they can't really walk it, they kind of just shuffle along the furniture, whatever they're holding on to. Well, there's the one day that she crawled over to the TV stand, and she pulled herself up to standing, and she's kind of shuffling along, and, and as she's going, she's got her eye on the DVD player. And she's looking as she gets close to it, and she starts to reach, and I say to her, no, don't touch. And as soon as I say, no, don't touch, she looks at me, and without breaking eye contact, and she touches. Oh, sinner. <laughs> and that's the natural rebellion in all of us. My daughter is not the only one born with that rebellion. We are all born with that towards God. Every last one of us. And that rebellion, that sin nature, is what Paul is referring to here. The law aroused our sinful desires. The law says, thou shall not, or thou shall, and we say, don't tell me what to do. And so then we do the things that we know we ought not to do. And so producing in us sinful actions, which the wages of sinful actions is death. Right? Sin leads to death. The wages of sin is death. That's what we've seen in Romans. But that's who we were. That's who we were before God saved us through Jesus Christ. That's who we were when we were under the law. But we have now died to the law. As we died to sin, having died in Christ, and so now we are alive with Christ. If we have truly put our trust in him. And that being the case, we see Paul show the contrast of now that we are in Christ, there in verse 6, when he says, but now. That's who we were before we were saved. That's who we were under the law. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. We are then free from the law, no longer under its condemnation and curse, for not upholding it, uh, and free from the law under which we remain in rebellion to God. When we trust in Christ, from that very moment on, we are now free to serve, to serve God as his slaves. We are free from the law to serve in the new way of the Spirit. We saw just last week, right? If we are saved, we are slaves of God. That's what Paul said. And as we see here, this word serve, the Greek word is the verb form of the noun slave. And so again, to, to have this all straight in our heads, what is it to be under the law? Let's make sure we understand this. And to do so, all we have to do is look to Israel's history. Under the law, they broke covenant with God. They grumbled and complained against God's chosen leaders and God himself. 
They incurred his judgment until he brought foreign oppressors on them to destroy them, to burn down Jerusalem and the temple. And those who survived were taken into exile and captivity. That was under the law's demands. That was under God's standard being held up before them, his righteous and good standard. And yet they, they could not keep that which was external, that was which was outside of them, that written code. And under the law's demands, we too are held captive to our rebellion. Having that external standard, the written code, crushing us under its demands, giving us no ability to do what it says and therefore continuing in sin, which leads to death. All the while, in our pride, we're trying to establish our own righteousness, right? We're trying to say, no, I am a good person. And so we're striving for at least our standard of righteousness. All the while, we are falling infinitely short of God's standard. And which standard? what standard is it that matters? God's. That's the one by which we'll be judged by. Instead, though, now that we are saved, now that we are trusting in Christ and therefore declared righteous, not having to try to strive to meet our, to, to establish our own righteousness, but are credited with the law keeping, law satisfying life and death of Jesus Christ, we stand in his righteousness, and that can never be taken away. We now are God's slaves serving in the new way of the Spirit. When God saves us, we then are able to live in the way that he has made, in the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit, who empowers us, who changes us from the inside out, growing us in holiness, giving us new desires in which we want to please God. That we're freed from our rebellion against God. We say, don't, don't tell me what to do. Now we're saying, no, I want to do what you tell me to do. I want to please you in everything. I see how glorious you are. I see how great you are. I see how much you loved me in sending Christ. How can I not love you in return? As the Holy Spirit works in us and transforms us. And so we desire to serve him. We desire to give ourselves to him. Not in order to be saved, but because we have been saved. And this is the only right response to being saved. Uh, this is the fruit, this is the product of being saved. This is what it means to be not under law, but under grace. And so let me ask you, do you see the Holy Spirit leading you in the new way of life? See, working in you, transforming you from the inside out? Are you a different person than you were before you trusted in Christ? If you're saved, what is being produced in your life as a result? Is the Holy Spirit, through his word, bringing the conviction of sin that you would turn from it? Are you progressively growing in holiness as the Holy Spirit illuminates your heart to the truth of God's word and empowering you to submit to it and obey it? and therefore causing you to seek to kill whatever sin you see remains in you. In his power, are you no longer freely letting sin work in you? That you do not look at the same things you used to look at. That you do not take talk the same way you used to talk. You do not go to the same places you used to go to. You don't listen to the same things you used to listen to. The things that would allow sin to take a foothold in your life. Do you hate your lust and your pride and your selfishness? Are you ashamed of your previous way of living and how you treated people and your attitudes and your way of thinking? Now, wherever you find sin, are you wanting to completely separate from it so that you can be holy unto God? That you can truly live because you know you belong to Christ. Because you love him who so loved you. Because as the Holy Spirit has convicted you of being such a great sinner, you now see what a great Savior Christ is, that he would save even you, as he saved even me. Do you see how he is worth living for? Verse 
Do you see how he's worth killing your sin for? How he's worth laying down your life for? If you really are saved, the Holy Spirit, in a progressive manner, is doing all of these works in you. He's bearing the fruit unto sanct- of sanctification that leads to eternal life. Under the law, you are captive under its condemnation, but now you died and have been united with Christ to belong to him who was raised in order that we may bear fruit for God. But if you're not trusting in Christ, you will not see such a change. You will not see this empowerment. I might say, there's things I want to change about me. You know, there's things I know people don't like or, you know, that, that society kind of looks down on or, or, or things that don't line up with me wanting to, you know, say that I'm a good person. And so there, there may be bad happens, things I want to change about myself, but external behavioral change is not what we're talking about here. Changing your behavior is different from turning from sin to live unto God. The external behavioral change is not the internal change by the work of the Holy Spirit. My friends, do you see how glorious God is? What a great and awesome Savior He is. If you are depending on your own works to be saved, if you are depending on on striving in and of yourself to, to say that you are righteous and good, I plead with you, see and look to God's law that you are a sinner in his sight, that you have broken his law and are under condemnation under the law. And so I plead with you, instead, turn to Christ. Trust in his goodness for you. Trust in his righteousness. Trust in the fact that he has dealt with the sin of all who would believe on him. He took the punishment and wrath that we deserve in our sin on himself, and he did so for all who will believe. And if you will believe upon Jesus Christ, you will know the penalty for your sin has been satisfied. That eternal wrath that you deserve has been taken away. And you have died to the law to now belong to Christ. And you, therefore, are free. I plead with you, trust in Jesus Christ. See how glorious he is. Look to him who gave his life for all who believe. Trust in him and see and find that he gave his life for you. Know this love. Know this sacrifice. Know this newness of life that is in Christ and in Christ alone. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visitnvbc.com.